Hi, I'm here to speak about clinical research in pediatrics and informed consent for parents. This is a topic that's very dear to my heart because it's so important to have pediatric patients represented in clinical research. And at the conclusion of the session, I'd like you to be able to understand the importance of pediatric clinical research, um, understand the differences between um, pediatric consent and adult consent, and the difference in pediatric participation versus adults. And then also to understand the truth behind common misperceptions regarding participation in pediatric clinical research. So what is pediatric research? That's the first main subject we want to tackle. Pediatric research, just like any sort of research in adults or in kids, is based on human subjects research. So that's exactly as it sounds. Human subjects are used um, in uh, different research, and this is voluntary informed consent of a person and it has to meet certain ethical standards of our international research community, which is very high. I, I think in adults, it's obvious what they are consenting to do. Normal adults have the mental capacity to understand the risks and the benefits and to either say yes or no uh, to be involved in clinical research. However, children are actually defined as persons not yet having attained the age of consent for treatment or procedures. Um, and so we have to take special precautions to make sure they actually understand uh, the risks and the benefits as well as their family. Uh, this also pertains to specific labeling regulations for prescription drugs. Children ages 0 to 16 by the Co Federal Code of Regulations need specific labeling. And so I spoke a little bit about the Code of Federal Regulations in terms of defining children. And they are actually who also regulates pediatric research. So the federal government has empowered institutional review boards, which are usually composed of members of the community, um, a board of experts, to review and approve and suggest modifications or even to disapprove research. Now, the need for that, the federal government obviously can't oversee everything, uh, nor do we necessarily want them to, so they've appointed institutional review boards at the local level. So these are smaller groups of people, and they're typically used in the fields of health and social sciences. And in the United States, um, IRBs are governed by Title 45 of the Code of Federal Regulations, and they define rules for institutional review and are required for all research that receives support either directly or indirectly from the U.S. federal government. And as I mentioned, IRBs themselves are regulated by the Office for Human Protections within the federal government. So what is the need for all the regulation? I think anybody who deals with children, works with children on a regular basis, knows that there are certain things that they understand and can't understand. And there are certain special groups of research subjects, including children, that are known as vulnerable populations. Um, other groups like this are pregnant women, the elderly, or mentally impaired, and we have to take special precautions in order to protect them. They're held up to a higher level of scrutiny um, in terms of research protocols and trials, and also more stringent thresholds of protection. So there are three categories of studies overseen by IRBs. The first is minimal risk to the child, with or without direct benefit. Now, minimal risk is defined as uh, minimal risk of harm or discomfort other than ordinarily encountered in the daily life or during the performance of routine physical or psychological examinations or tests. There's the second category overseen by IRBs, which is a minor increase over minimal risk with direct benefit to the child. So as the first is just minimal risk, um, it can have or not have direct benefit. But the second that has a little bit more increase in risk needs to have direct benefit to the child. And then there's the third and final, which is more than minimal or minor increase in risk, but also with direct benefit. Um, and so you might have heard of these in the past as therapeutic research. This is often, um, for an example, in cancer um, medications, cancer clinical trials. So I've now talked to you about why it's so important to minimize risk and maximize benefit. And I think it's obvious why we need to protect our vulnerable populations, such as kids, with more scrutiny and protection uh, in general. But why is pediatric research so important? Our primary goal is to make sure that the drugs and the diagnostic testing used in children has actually been tested on children. A lot of things that are used have been tested in these large clinical trials in adults and are therefore used in a kind of an off-label way for other ages and indications. But children are not small adults. They metabolize medications differently. We have a longer period of time over which we're ensuring that they don't have any side effects uh, or developmental kind of risks. And so 
children need to be uh, represented in clinical research in a different way. They need to certainly be included in these clinical research trials. So research is not only important to establish safety, effectiveness, and appropriate dosing for children. I think often we think of medication research trials in children who are ill. But it's also really important to think about research in children who are healthy and the ways they can contribute. So something called normative data, that's also so very important when we are looking at the way that children respond to medications and to diagnostic testing. And so children who are healthy also have something to contribute. This can be children who are siblings of um, those with pulmonary hypertension um, or any other normal healthy children who are interested in being involved in research, whether it's something as simple as a blood draw or something um, like being involved in a more complicated research trial. We need what are called normative values for age and gender. And it's really important to be able to say what's normal. So what's normal for another five-year-old who does not have disease, it's important to have that baseline. And it can be a chance for healthy siblings, as I mentioned, to really contribute to future therapy and therapeutic monitoring. So the bottom line is children do get sick and they need medication. And it is our strong feeling that they should have access to medicines, diagnostic tests, and that have been properly evaluated for them, not just for adults. And this really does require thoughtful drug development and including children in research trials. Now, as I mentioned before, research studies in children are overseen by experts, an IRB panel, and limited to minimal risk or minor risk with direct benefit to the child. And the goal of this oversight is to minimize the risk and maximize benefits. Getting into pediatric drug development laws, there's also special provisions for uh, the development of pediatric drugs. So there's the Pediatric Research Equity Act, and this requires companies to assess safety and effectiveness of new therapies in pediatric patients except for orphan drugs or diseases that do not occur for children. There's the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act, and this provides a financial incentive to companies who voluntarily conduct pediatric studies. And the goals of these laws is really to uh, encourage appropriate use of medicine and the formulation of medicine, of course, in treating pediatric patients. I had mentioned this orphan drug designation, and that's when there are very rare diseases that aren't likely by the pharmaceutical industry standards to actually provide any sort of profit to have a financial incentive. And the government has also helped to make a special designation for these drugs. Oftentimes, orphan drugs, very rare diseases, and such occur in young children. They're rare diseases, they're often due to genetic abnormalities. And so it's very important that these are studied just as carefully. And so that's why it's helpful that even though they might not make a financial profit, there are special provisions um, made for them, whether it is FDA regulation and testing or providing um, financial help to companies who are actually trying to formulate these medications. Now, proof of a medication's effectiveness can be taken from adult studies, and we do this a lot. Um, you'll see data being extrapolated from these large adult studies I was telling you about. But is that always the best thing for the child? And I think the answer is obviously no, which is why we're so focused on the importance of pediatric representation in clinical research. However, there are some instances where medication's effectiveness can actually be really well um, estimated from how well it works in adults, and that's when the disease course um, and treatment response is similar and in some older kids. So even if we know that, though, that we can kind of assume that um, a certain drug is going to work well in a certain disease with a similar progression, we need to do dosing studies. So dosing studies are still necessary to ensure we're giving correct doses to children. The topic of informed consent for parents and guardians um, is an important one to discuss as well. So children ages seven and older are invited to assent to participate, so they'll give their permission. As we discussed earlier, it can be hard to know if children have the mental capacity to understand the risks and the benefits. And their parents, oftentimes, either one or both, will act as a surrogate for them in giving informed consent. But we do like children to understand at a, um, a developmentally appropriate level the procedures um, and or tests or research they're being involved in and have the chance to say yes or no. I think very importantly to know, families are always given the information about how to withdraw from research studies and who to contact if concern arises. So if a roadblock to being involved in clinical research is worry that you won't be able to withdraw at any time, 
please don't be worried about that. You can withdraw from research at any time and for any reason, and you don't even have to give a reason. Research can't really begin prior to informed consent, so you never have to worry that things will be done without your consent for your child. Safety measures we've also discussed, and safety measures for children are even more stringent than for adults. So children will receive the same care whether or not they're participating in research. And research protocols require the permission of at least one and often both parents, as I had mentioned earlier, as well as the assent of a child. So in summary, in order to have medications and tests that are safe and optimized for kids, pediatric research is vital. It's very important for children to be represented in clinical trials. Children are a vulnerable population for whom research protocols undergo more intense scrutiny and more stringent thresholds are required. And finally, pediatric research is carefully and ethically supervised with careful monitoring for adverse reaction. And there's the ability of parents to withdraw their children at any time for any reason. Music